A good day, people. So I've said elsewhere that I think in order for people to really address all of the kinds of causes that we would want to address, you'd have to at least include Aristotle's four of efficient, material, formal, and final. I want to just focus here on material and efficient, which I think are the two that prevail within science, even if formal and final perhaps are getting a little more interest as of late. I think part of the problem in getting at material and efficient causality is that it seems as if some people seem to be suggesting something like this, that on the one hand you have determinacy and constraint, and on the other hand you have something like freedom or agency, and in order to have freedom or agency, what you really need to have is freedom from constraint. And that's, I guess, the argument I would want to argue against. Right? That, that doesn't really make sense. Instead, what you get is increasingly that the kinds of constraint make freedom possible. That what we mean by constraint and increased levels of constraint open up various kinds of agency and or deliberation and or I guess what we're going to call the experience of freedom. And it has to do with the way that in putting rules and constraints in a narrowing, narrowing set of, I guess, functional parameters, one can have an experience of a kind of conscience agency that reaches to wider and wider expanses. And I'm going to see if I can not just, again, really quickly try to lay out this position. Now, part of the way you'd come at it is to say, what do we mean by the kinds of causality that come into play as you move from the inorganic to the organic and then through the various levels of the organic all the way up into life? So we could say, you know, what are the kinds of causality that come into play as you move from the domain roughly of physics to biology, and then in biology you'd want to split it out, I think, into anatomy and physiology, and then you'd also probably want to be able to break that out into, even before that, you'd want to break it out into very early forms of life, the bacteria and protists and the other forms that were pre-sexual forms of of uh, regeneration or I guess growth and development and there from there I guess you're going to get sexual reproduction and then you're going to get again various forms of physiology anatomy ver various forms of life and then you're going to get com more and more complex kinds of nervous systems limbic systems as you get into mammals and then organisms with something like culture, humans with historicity and linguistics. It's like as you're moving through these domains, at no point are you leaving behind the kinds of causality of the previous or the prior or of the lower level, but you're adding new levels of constraint atop of those prior levels. And each addition of like each additional level, which is kind of like a recursivity of causality sort of folding back within itself and demanding um, greater kinds of constraints for the sake of a new forms of free play. And so, I mean, just think of the you know, the origin of life being the establishment of something like a membrane or a cell wall that allowed for the differentiation of an organism and an environment. And when you move to something like, let's take these three processes, right? And these are, um, I guess, these are prior to sexual reproduction, okay? So if you have respiration, metabolism, and... Um, what respiration, metabolism, and digestion. Yeah, I mean, just those three in general, they seem to be different relations of causality. That is, you, although they're causal relations, and there are causal relations between what you're able to metabolize, what are the particular chemicals, the kinds of molecules that are involved in respiration, and what exactly is 
edible and digestible for any given organism. And, but those are material and efficient causal relations, but they're of a different order of complexity than anything at the inorganic world. Right? At, the, at the level of the inorganic, you don't have the causal relations of respiration, digestion, or metabolism. Now, life itself has those capacities for hundreds of millions of years before anything like sexual reproduction enters the scene. But once sexual reproduction enters the scene and you get multicellularity, both in plants and animals, now you have what could be called the emergence right, of cross-fertility as a delimitation of the kind of probability field that opens up with uh, that development. Right? So it's like you could see as you move from each level... And I think the levels are simultaneous. So right now, my body is completely subject to physical laws and physical forces. But the physical forces seem very brute. There, you know, it's you basically have literally forces of mass, acceleration. You have gravitational attractions. You have, I guess, electromagnetic rays and things that are affecting the body at, at in certain ways. But it's like those seem very different, I guess, than the the kinds of things that we're talking about when we talk about life, motility, appetites and desires, and the kind of probabilities that open up with the need to feed the appetite and to sort of rove through space and all of the various contingencies that come from again, the establishment of a, of a cell boundary or of, of an organismal boundary in its relationship to its environment. Right? It's like there are internally complexifying greater levels of constraint that then make certain kinds, again, of probability fields crop up under which there's a free play or a kind of agentative function within that probability field. And it's, as I say, everything, you know, it begins with life itself, but then it becomes more and more nuanced, finer and finer grade, and increasing ranges and expanses of, I guess, space and time come to be incorporated. So, as I say, you know, at first, prior to sexual reproduction, it's very local. It's, it's basically constrained to respiration, to metabolism, and to digestion. But once you get hereditary selection and the kinds of contingencies that come from sexual variety, and then also, I guess, the problematic relationships of organisms who need to find a mate and that reproducing becomes, I guess, a mandate for the organism within a probability field for which failure increasingly becomes possible. See, failure doesn't really make sense at the level of the inorganic, but failure to achieve various kinds of probabilities within the field that's been opened for that level of causality, see, that increasingly starts to happen as you move up the uh, up these various levels. So take then the, again, really important drift between, or let, let's go back to the, even the mating. I mean, mating and sexual reproduction and the the boundaries of cross fertility between organisms right i mean certain organisms like take species of dogs right or k kinds of dogs right they're able to the, you know reproduce offspring that mix breeds right so you have these various breeds of dogs that um again where, where cross fertility is itself a kind of operating parameter of free play within a completely deterministic field. And you can see this with, you know, throughout the animal kingdom that, you know, sexuality is a freer play than cross fertility. Cross fertility somehow sets the the range of where the causal forces will come into play, that an organism has to mate with, 
a opposite sex of a species with which it's cross fertile in order to produce and in order to have that causal effect come in. Now, none of that is in play at the inorganic. None of that is even in play at the level of the hundreds of millions of years before those kinds of evolutionary developments came in. But now the kinds of Again, it's constraints that make possible a, pro a probability field under which free play occurs. Now, take the move from what's digestible or what's edible into what's food or not food. Right? When you go from culture to culture, there's great variation on what people recognize as food and not food. I mean, some people will, you know, some cultures, they'll eat rattlesnakes and beetles and slugs. Other people have a largely vegetarian diet. Uh, some people eat a lot of meat. When you look at those ranges and the fact that they're often tied to political beliefs, to religious beliefs, to social, cultural, to family ties and traditions, it becomes apparent that this is a whole new level of constraint that comes in but the constraint here is one that makes free play for identity that is certain kinds of identities and self-awareness becomes possible in constraining cultural members in to what they designate as food or not food in their dietary practices now these are of course subject to wider and wider free play. That is, what is edible or not edible, that is set by biology. But what one calls food or not food, that is so much more subject to cultural variety. And in that sense, there's culturally free play, but within a culture, a person's diet you know, that they must eat, yes, that's one of the now inevitabilities that emerges from the probability field of being an organism that's alive, that needs nutrients, that needs to seek those nutrients from the environment, that you're not, you don't just have photosynthesis as your capacity. But to that extent, you're free to select what you're going to eat to the extent that those aren't scarce resources in the environment. I mean, there's going to be interactive relations, but once there's something like abundance or more than scarce conditions, the, the possibilities for choice were one of the things that were liberated into that organism that took on the constraints of being an organism that can, you know, has motility and can seek out uh, food in its environment or nutrients in, an, in its environment, which nothing in the inorganic level can do that. I mean, nothing at the inorganic level has the kind of cell boundaries by which that matter can relate to the larger environment with relations of, quotes, appetite and desire or frustration. See, those are causal relations, but they're causal relations at a different order of complexity, not outside of the physical laws, but in addition to. See, so as you're moving from physics to chemistry to biology to psychology to sociology to history to linguistic, each time you keep encumbering greater and greater orders of internal complexity and demands of constraints that open up new probability fields under which greater forms of freedom within that probability field become possible. Now let's move all the way up to language and just sort of cut to the chase. When you move to language, okay, so there are certain physical forces that are under play and lots of biological forces. I mean, there, there were lots of evolutionary developments that were required in order for primates, higher primates, to be able to control their breath to make elongated, articulated thought such as this possible. That is, it has to do with dynamics of the chest, it had to do with the larynx, it had to do not simply with brain size. I mean, brain size isn't to be denied at all, but to really look at how speech production is possible, you'd have to be able to address brain size, you'd have to be able to address the upright posture, the kind of chest that humans have as opposed to the kind of chest that you find in a good number of other primates. Uh, so th there's a whole host of other factors that are going on. But so that's at the biological level. There's also, again, physical constraints. There's acoustical levels. I mean, there's sound waves moving at certain uh, speeds. But 
the phonetic values that are able to be produced by the organism are very different than those constraints that produce what will become recognized as words by cultural members. And as I learn a language, I take on the constraints of the language in order to be free to speak. Literacy is then a greater constraint. Literacy is a hyper constraint. It's a set of constraints on speech, but that liberates speech up, not only in the sense that I am now free to communicate to people in distant places and distant times, but it has an effect of constraining my own thought into the kind of rigor that then bleeds over into my everyday speech. So there are kinds of constraints that make freedom possible. And what's so interesting about language is that as you take, as you get forced into learning the language by, I guess, surrounding, again, in infants, they hear it spoken around them. And there are, again, sort of physical processes, biological processes, physiological processes that are all going on and social historical cultural processes linguistic processes that are all happening conspiring to make the person produce words but a word is at a different level of abstraction than any of the sound values that you could capture in the physical space but notice because of that because the the words themselves aren't contained at the level of the physical sound, but they're somehow they're abstractions such that anyone speaking any language could hear these sounds, but you have to know English in order to know what the words are. That really means that the imagination has been liberated from the particular space-time of the speaker. Speakers are able to talk about things like the Big Bang. We're able to talk about the fact that we know that the Earth's life is limited in that eventually, I don't know how many hundreds of millions or billions of years it will be, but somehow the Earth's life will end. And so we can see the kind of probability field and even the inevitabilities that come from within a probability field. You know, we, we can know of our own death. We can know that we very may likely lose our ability to speak or our ability to be conscious before we even die. I mean, there are lots of ways that these constraints, I guess, break down and we see the inevitabilities that are implied by, I guess, probabilities and possibilities. But I think the, the overarching point that I, I really keep trying to raise here is that if people want to understand causality, you don't want to say there's a causal forces and then causal forces. What you want to understand is the kind of growing evolution of inward complexification of constraints and how constraints make probability fields and within those probability fields you have increasingly forms you have it forms of greater degrees of liberated freedom and movement within that more constrained probability field and so you know, gravity affects everything everywhere at once whereas appetites and desires are more and more limited to the range, I guess, of uh, the organism's environment and what it's, it's going toward. But as you move up to the organism's capacities to deal with language and then communication technologies like the microscope and the telescope and the telegraph writing itself, you start to see that there are there are greater ranges for possible action because the delimited probability field of the human has been opened through taking on such rigorous, rigorous demanding constraints. So in some sense, we're highly, highly confined to a very, very narrowly prescribed probability field, the kind of probability field that comes from making sense out of the kinds of intelligibility that language and thought can make. And yet, because that's disentangled and more abstract than, I guess, the kind of physiological, biological kinds of probability fields, it allows for a, re a free-ranging play that allows us, again, just to think about things like, again, the Big Bang and the ultimate end of it all.
Okay, so hopefully that will help some people understand how causality is not to be set in contrast to agency.